I'm Joe Halco, Director of Community Relations for Northwestern Counseling and Support Services, and welcome to another episode of NCSS Here For You. Since 1958, Northwestern Counseling and Support Services has been providing access to high-quality services which promote healthy living and emotional well-being to the residents of Franklin and Grand Isle counties. Over the years, as the needs of the community have changed, so too have the programs and services that we make available to assist children, adolescents, adults, families, and seniors. We take our role in the community seriously and strive to provide a continuum of the highest quality services to meet the needs of individuals who at any point seek assistance. This month's episode is titled Suicide Prevention Awareness Month. From 1999 to 2016, Vermont had the second highest increase of any state for people that died by suicide. During 2016, 118 people died by suicide, which means on average, someone dies by suicide in our state every three days. Suicide is also the second leading cause of death for Vermonters aged 15 through 34. What are the risk factors? Are there programs and services available for individuals that are struggling with suicidal thoughts? And are there trainings that can help with understanding early warning signs? We'll address these topics and more today. Plus, we'll also discuss Afterglow, a music festival for suicide awareness and prevention, which will be held on September the 21st at Hardack Hill in St. Albans. Now I'd like to introduce this month's guests, and they are John Holscheider and Andrea Wells, the parents of AJ, who died by suicide on November 30th, 2018. Tony Stevens, CSS Crisis Team Leader, and Lance Mateer, Team Leader of NCSS School-Based Clinical Services and Community First Project Coordinator. I'd like to welcome all of you to the program this month. So let's start with what are some of the risk factors? All right. So there are definitely risk factors to suicide. Um, but what we also know is that suicide impacts everyone. Um, some people are impacted disproportionately or maybe more at risk. So some of those risk, risk factors do include um, the use of drugs or alcohol, having a previous suicide attempt, um, having a suicide either in your family, um, someone close to you or someone who you look up to, even someone in the community. Um, we know that when someone dies by suicide, it makes it that much more real of an option um, for everyone. Mm -hmm. um, having social, social isolation as well, um, not feeling really connected uh, with people. Um, also having an underlying mental health condition uh, such as depression or anxiety. What we know is that 90% of the people who die by suicide are actually living with a treatable um, mental health challenge. Mm -hmm. And uh, what are warning signs to consider? There's a number of them for sure, Joe. I mean, oftentimes when we think of it, people may say things and talk about things. They may talk about killing themselves or harming themselves. Mm -hmm. um, people may often express a lot of feelings of hopelessness. Um, or even that they feel that there's no reason to live. I think Lance mentioned sometimes that kind of isolation, may, you may see that going on. Um, people may feel like they're a burden to others, or maybe the friends, family, loved ones are better off without them. Um, and oftentimes people might be experiencing some uncontrollable or um, unbearable pain, and that could be physical, that could be emotional, spiritual, and it's really kind of hard to quantify. You may see different behaviors with folks. Um, Maybe an increase in use of drugs or alcohol. Um, maybe even be looking up or kind of researching different ways of sort of ending their life or methods. Um, or sometimes you might see people kind of making, um, trying to make amends with people or sort of give away prized possessions, kind of almost like making preparations as if they are going to do something. And then their mood itself, you may see some changes. Um, obviously sort of depression or anxiety are very common. Um, we see loss of interest, more isolation from folks. Um, and sometimes uh, folks who die by suicide might be sort of struggling with sort of a feeling of humility or, or shame um, about something that they might have going on. Um, and then, you know, I think 
it might seem counterintuitive, but sometimes people that have been thinking about suicide might often suddenly appear much better. They might seem like a sense of relief or a sudden improvement. Um, and that's kind of hard to explain, but some people believe that maybe they've made a decision and, and that's they're feeling a sense of relief about that. Mm -hmm. so. And what are some ways to respond to suicidal behavior? Yeah. So I think it's really important uh, if you're having a conversation with someone about suicide to be really direct, uh, open and honest. Thank them um, actually for talking to you about suicide. Um, if you think about how much courage it takes someone to actually have a conversation with you about, mm -hmm. about their suicidal thoughts, it's probably the most vulnerable that they've ever been in their life. Um, and you're there to support them emotionally. Um, but it's a good thing if you're talking with someone about suicide because it means that uh, we can provide intervention, we can provide safety for them. Um, so the first thing that we want to do is never leave a person alone, um, which means that, that we should be with them if it's safe for us to do so. Um, we can reach out to family members, uh, we can reach out to NCSS, which I would always encourage that we do. We have a crisis line that's available for everyone in Franklin and Grand Isle County that's actually um, available 24 hours a day. Um, so if you're sitting with someone who may be suicidal or if you're concerned about someone who is suicidal, you can call that line and get support with them. Um, from there, we would want to really engage that person, have them be a really active participant in creating a safety plan um, in, in making sure that um, we move forward and put supports in place for them. And Lance, what is that number that people would call? Yeah, so that number is 524-6554, um, and it's our main line. That's also our crisis number as well, and again, that's available 24-7, so it doesn't matter if it's night or weekend or holiday. Um, we always have a crisis clinician available to meet with someone. Okay. Uh, John and Andrea, I know that uh, you wanted to share your story with the audience today. Yep. Um, I agree with you know everything that we've heard from uh, Lance and Tony with regards to you know the various signs and signals and reasons and cues, etc. Um, but I want to throw out there that you know sometimes they don't exist and you don't see them, which was our case. Mm -hmm. um, I I like to think that that there's five basic needs that people have in life. Uh, food, water, and shelter are pretty simple to understand. Uh, one of those is social acceptance, uh, number four, having family and friends and interaction. Mm -hmm. um, and then the fifth one is a purpose in life. And uh, well, AJ had all four. And uh, his fifth purpose, I think at his age, was that he was uh, an incredible athlete and he had a huge passion for skiing. And uh, the last two and a half years of his life, he suffered from ACL injuries that were sports related. And this changed his social circle mm -hmm. at school. Um, it uh, had a pretty substantial impact um, on who he was because he was this great athlete that had a lot of skill and talent and he was used to being on the field and he he had been off the snow for two and a half years and so you know you see the um the physical side of it where he's walking on crutches and he's getting himself better but uh he was able to you know keep the mental side of it in check at mm -hmm. least we thought and stayed focused um by continuing to work very hard in the gym and physically to, to get back on the snow and, and, and back on the athletic fields. And um, it's, it's our belief and from you know, signs that we've learned after he died that he had re-injured his knee. And we believe that he thought that he would never ski again, that he'd never be able to participate in the activities and he saw that as his purpose and that's the life that he wanted to live and so we had no clue um, at all in fact we didn't even know that he had injured himself that day and uh, so I think um, 
one of the main things that we want to try to bring to people's light in addition to what the guys have said behind us is that if you have athletes that have suffered injuries and have been taken off the field, um, that that's, a, that's something that needs to have some attention, especially if there is, uh, if they're limited in ever being able to go back to those fields again. Mm -hmm. If their injuries are serious enough that they, they may not be able to participate in that activity that they loved, um, especially at such a, a young age of, you know, teenagers or young 20s, that they may not see the, the other options and opportunities that are lay, lay in wait. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it's a rash decision and uh, having a focus and being able to, to be aware and alert that if you've got a kid that's, that's suffered some injuries, to, uh, that that might be another indicator to, to keep an eye on them. Mm -hmm. If you have anything to add to that, but <clears throat> okay. Now, um, tell us about Afterglow, the uh, upcoming musical festival that uh, you're hosting in honor of AJ. Right. Um, well, first of all, Afterglow is a uh, is a poem that uh, my grandmother loved, and um, it talks about uh, dying and how you want to be rem remembered afterwards. And um, it was uh, something that uh, was read at her funeral. And from that point on, I, I took a liking to it. And our whole family took a liking to, to the poem. And when we lost AJ, it seemed like the, the way that we wanted to remember him mm -hmm. was the, the way that this poem was written. And uh, we knew we wanted to do something to honor him, and we didn't know what it was. But uh, in the following weeks after we lost AJ, we learned, I learned that he was, we both, I guess, learned that uh, he was quite the little DJ and was always playing music, uh, whether it was for his friends or for adult groups, and that he had uh, a pretty big passion for, for music. And uh, he learned to, uh, to ski up at Hardak. He played lacrosse and soccer at Hardak. And it just, it's something that I, I as a, involved with Hardak for the last 20 years, we've always wanted to have a music festival. And one night it just kind of hit me. And I was like, a music festival? And we call it Afterglow. And I ran it through Andrea and the rest of our family. And everybody liked the idea. And, and so because of his involvement in, in uh, sports at Hard Act, that's mm -hmm. why we wanted to have it there. Mm -hmm. Being the president of Hard Act, I had, well, I didn't have to convince too many people that, <laughs> okay, <laughs> um, the, the city wanted to do that. And, and so I know a bunch of people and friends that were in bands, and we were just like, let's have a day of music that, that's free for people in the community so we all can celebrate and give something back and, and make a little something good out of what we're doing. Uh, raise some fun, some money that will, will help prevent and, and um, increase awareness for suicide. And our partnership with Northwestern Counseling is, is big and, and gonna help us with the content uh, so that we're legitimately talking about the right points for suicide. Mm -hmm. um, but we're also gonna try to help make it easier to get the kids off the couches and on the snow and out there playing lacrosse and soccer and the other types of uh, programs that uh, the St. Albans Rec Department has. And that's really what it's all about is, is celebrating. And it, um, you know, it happens to be AJ's birthday weekend. He will be 19 the, the day before. So our hope is to, to hold it on his birthday weekend and uh, have, have something that everybody in the community can come, come enjoy as a family and not have to you know, buy ridiculously expensive tickets and they can mm -hmm. just come, it's mm -hmm. free. And what are the hours going to be for the uh, event? Uh, so we are, we're gonna run from noon until nine. Mm -hmm. uh, we have uh, five acts. We have um, acoustic Rodney, 
uh, the band Squirrel, uh, Barbie and Bones, uh, Glass Onion, and <clears throat> Jamie Lee Thurston is going to be our headliner. And uh, we've partnered with Heritage Toyota, 14 Star, Daringer, um, T Transp TIA. Transportation Insurance Advisors. And those are some of our, our big sponsors that are really stepping up and helping us cover some of the big costs. And uh, so, you know, we're looking for volunteers. We're looking for people to come and have fun. Uh, you know, sponsorships of all different levels from $250 all the way up to 5000 you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're just looking to have a, a fun day uh, and do some good. And what number do they call if they're interested, John? Oh, well, I guess I'll give them my number. 802-363-4156. <laughs> <coughs> But the best way to find out more about it would just be go on Facebook mm -hmm. and uh, you know search on Afterglow. We have an Afterglow page. We have an Afterglow events page. And they can also go to the St. Albans Recreation Center's website, and there's information there, too. Okay, that's, that sounds terrific. And I'm sure it's going to be an outstanding day. No, there's no doubt in my mind. We hope so. AJ's in charge of the weather. That's, that's his <laughs> only, only job. Thing, right? <laughs> We're going to do everything else. It's his job to take care of the weather. So, you got that, bud? It sounds like a plan. <laughs> now, um, what programs and services does NCSS make available to help an individual or to promote suicide prevention mm -hmm. in the community? I think... Um, I can answer that. You know, I, obviously, Lance had mentioned our 24-7 crisis team. That's always been in existence and will continue to be a resource for anybody in our two-county area. Um, we have an offshoot of that team that is our mobile outreach team that does a lot of um, proactive work with folks who are maybe going into crisis or struggling with a mental health issue, and then a lot of follow-up afterwards. And that team also includes... Um, clinicians that we have embedded in not only law enforcement, the St. Albans City Police Department and the Vermont State Police, but also one right in the emergency department who is able to work with folks who may not actively be in crisis and might just be coming in for a medical issue. And it's a chance to connect with a licensed clinical social worker who might be able to sort of link them into services. Um, we have an uh, integrated health team that is pretty much in every primary care office throughout Franklin and Grand Isle County. So we've got social workers embedded in those offices. Oftentimes people are not coming to the clinic or the agency for support, mm -hmm. they are getting it out in the community where we have satellite locations and folks embedded. Um, similar to Lance manages a team of school-based clinicians that are in almost all the schools. So a lot of great work happening in the schools where sometimes kids and adolescents might not be coming in to get support yeah. and they're getting it right there at school. Um, and a large outpatient team working with all ages and families. Um, and then really countless other programs at NCSS between our Behavioral Health Division, our Children, Youth, and Family Division, and our Developmental Services Division. One could really argue that any, any program we have can help um, increase wellness, connectedness, and ultimately impact suicide and assist with suicide prevention. Mm -hmm. And um, what trainings does NCSS offer the community members to uh, help with suicide prevention awareness mm -hmm. as well? So we do have several trainings. Um, one of those is called uh, the Mental Health First Aid Training. We do have a youth and an adult version of that training. And really it gives um, a lot of great information. It's, it's suicide prevention training, but it's larger than that as well because we talk about mental health. We talk about the impact of stigma um, and how that negatively impacts people in our community who are living with mental health challenges. Um, and uh, we also talk about how to recognize the warning signs, not only of suicide, but mental health challenges mm -hmm. as well. So the point is that if we can provide early intervention uh, and referral to, to resources, we know that recovery for people will happen quicker um, and that, that we can improve our lives, right? That, that mental health challenge um, isn't something that's permanent. We can get better from that, just like a physical health challenge. Um, so over the last uh, about four years, about 3,500 Vermonters have taken the mental health first aid training, either the youth or adult version, um, and about 900 of, of, of those people that have been trained are actually uh, from Franklin or Grand Isle County. Mm -hmm. um, so we've definitely done a lot of training in our area. Um, the hope is just, you know, just like John was talking about, the more that we can have the dialogue about uh, suicide and suicide prevention and make it really acceptable to talk about and um, link people to services and supports. Um, hopefully that will prevent suicide in our community. Um, 
So we do that through training. Um, another training that we offer is the You Matter Suicide Prevention Training or Gatekeeper Training. Um, this provides people with information about how to recognize the signs and symptoms of suicide and then also talks about some of the services and supports that are available in the community, but also uh, teaches what community members can do um, to provide intervention with someone who may be suicidal. Mm -hmm. And my understanding is that all three of these trainings you're going to uh, at the Afterglow event um, have the ability for people to sign up for future trainings? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so all of the trainings as well that we provide um, around suicide are actually free to the community as well. So I think um, you know when we're talking about accessibility and, and making this information accessible, I think that goes a long way. We want people to be educated. We, we want people to know the signs and symptoms of suicide, the warning signs, um, and to be signing up for trainings. Mm -hmm. And the trainings don't always have to be at NCSS, I think, as will be evidenced in this building. I believe tomorrow you have a mental health training class here. Yeah, absolutely. So tomorrow um, we do have a full, a full training here at Northwestern <coughs> Access, so that is great. Now, but we also do a lot of trainings on site as well. So we've been to a lot of schools and, and some businesses um, and other nonprofit agencies uh, throughout Franklin and Grand, Grand Isle County. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, tell us about the Survivors of Suicide group that meets monthly. Yeah, uh, maybe seven or eight years ago, a colleague of mine, Deb Babby, and I um, started a, a support group specific to folks who had lost a loved one to suicide. That was something that wasn't in existence up here, mm -hmm. but was in other parts of Vermont, especially in the Burlington area. Um, and so we, we've been fortunate enough to start that training up here. I, I wish we didn't need it, but we do. Um, I'm sorry, not training, but the support group. Um, it's a small group. We meet monthly. There, it's free. There's no kind of commitment whatsoever, mm -hmm. but it's just really creating a safe place to get folks together who have lost um, somebody they care about to suicide. Suicide, grief from suicide is very similar to many other types of grief, but I think there are some unique pieces to it and, and just kind of to get people together into a place where they, they know they are sitting with others who have experienced some kind of similar <coughs> loss has I think really kind of brought on a lot of supportive relationships from that group. Um, you know, I think uh, currently the, the the group that runs in Burlington is actually so large that they've stopped taking new people in. So they're kind of referring people north towards us. Um, and, and we're happy to accommodate that. We're a much smaller group. You know, it could be anywhere from three people to seven or eight people. Mm -hmm. um, and we can accommodate really any size, but it's just nice to kind of have that space for people. But it's also, too, uh, I, I mean, critically important that individuals know that there's a place that they can go and mm -hmm. share their deepest thoughts with mm -hmm. others who have been impacted in much the same way yep. and not feel as if um, there's any barriers to, to conversation, I guess. Yeah. Just before coming in here uh, about an hour ago, I was on the phone with somebody who had, had seen an advertisement for the group and mm -hmm. was calling to get more information. And, and through that conversation, we were kind of talking and, and this person decided that they would also like to get some individual counseling. They'd lost their daughter just about seven or eight months ago and are, is kind of now reaching a point of readiness to be able to talk about that. So I'm glad they reached out and were able to connect them with whatever feels comfortable for them. Mm -hmm. Uh, John or Andrea, is there anything else you'd like to uh, share at this point? Uh... Oh, there's, I could go on and on, that's, mm -hmm. that's for sure. Um, I, think, um, I think that you've, we've probably uh, addressed it. I, I, do, I can't remember if I mentioned that uh, my family business is also um, a, a helping us out a lot, and that's A.M. Daringer. Yes, you did. I, so I don't want to get in trouble with my brother. I've <laughs> forgotten that he was one of the first people to, to step up and help us. But um, I, I just I hope that uh, people will um, jump on Afterglow and come out and have some fun and um, consider being a volunteer or a sponsor and buying a T-shirt and, and helping us um, raise some money for NCSS, Hardack and the Rec Department. and. Keep, uh, keep these, uh, these things going. 
Well, you know, when you had mentioned the musical acts, but it's my understanding that there's also going to be some activities for children and uh, for a part of the day at least. Absolutely. Uh, we will have uh, some jumpy castles up there and some face, face painting, painting going on and, you know, uh, some some of that going on. You know, this is at Hard Act. We are a recreation center. Um, we have a, a vast network of trails that uh, I would bet uh, a, a Maybe two to five percent of people in Franklin County and St. Albans have uh, have actually been on. So mm -hmm. it, to to give guided tours <coughs> is uh, something that we're doing that day also. So there'll be quite a bit going on. A lot going 12 on. And, yeah. Between we're twelve, keep and people nine. busy. <laughs> okay. <coughs> Okay, any final thoughts for either of you gentlemen? On, uh... I think I would just mention it, similar to Lance and, and John saying, you know, I, I think we're excited to also partner with uh, Afterglow just Absolutely. in terms of just normalizing, just taking a day that's meant to not only celebrate, you know, the life of somebody, but raise awareness in a, in a fun kind of normal way mm -hmm. and, and sort of take the stigma away from things, make it okay to talk about. Um, and the impact of that is is huge. Yeah. And so to just be able to, to partner in a way like this, I think is a wonderful opportunity for everybody and for our community. If there, if there was anything I would add, it is this, that um, we as parents have many avenues to go to, to talk to our kids about um, drugs and alcohol, drinking and driving, safe sex, that type of stuff, mm -hmm. and I think we all will will admit that you know we talk to our kids about this, but I think that many parents are afraid to talk about suicide, and that they don't even want to bring it up and mm -hmm. introduce the concept. So, um, besides those areas, we need to teach parents how to talk about suicide, how to bring it up, and identify. The huts, the hot spots, and and just have the conversations with your kids, and teach us how to do it. And I and I hope that through Afterglow and our partnership with uh, Northwest Counseling, that that is something that gets conveyed is how do we as parents introduce the topic and talk about it with our kids, mm -hmm. um, so that we can prevent it. If we can through Afterglow prevent one family. Then we've done our we've done our job, but we hope to reach many more. No one could have said it better, John. You're right. Even if one family, one person, it makes everything worth the effort. I want to thank my guests, John Holscheider. Andrea Wells, Tony Stevens, and Lance Mateer for sharing their insights about suicide prevention awareness and the upcoming music festival in AJ's honor to raise awareness of suicide and prevention efforts that NCSS provides the community throughout the year. I also want to thank you, the viewer, for spending time with us again this month. You can learn more about all of our NCSS programs and services by logging on to ncssinc.org. I'm Joe Halco, and I'll be back again next month with another episode of NCSS Here For You.